So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> and thank you for joining us here today. I mean, um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. And I think after Tony's session, we are moving into another very rich and compelling conversation on Indigenous studies as a field. And we have with us uh, four speakers, four prolific speakers, and uh, who'll be covering much ground and uh, you know asking important questions for sure. So basically, what I was thinking was I'll introduce the first two speakers and then you know have them present, and then we'll keep present you know keep introducing speakers as we go ahead. Um, so we have with us uh, Dr. Kiara Minestrelli, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Media at the London College of Communications, and a course leader of the BA Honors Contemporary. Media Cultures in London. Um, she holds a doctorate in Indigenous Studies from Monash University and her monograph, uh, Australian Indigenous Hip Hop, The Politics of Culture, Identity and Spirituality, uh, published by Rutledge, is an ethnographic study that investigates the discursive and performative strategies employed by Australian Indigenous artists to discuss politics, identity, culture and spirituality through hip hop music and culture. Her current book project, Doing Indigenous Studies in Europe, Ethical Dilemmas, Challenges, and Opportunities explores the criticalities of doing Indigenous studies from Europe, as the title suggests. And Dr. Ministrelli keeps on collaborating with various First Nations in Australia, South, and North America. And over the years, she has organized several events that saw the participation of Indigenous artists, scholars, and activists. And she's currently working on the potential of virtual reality as a tool that can encourage digital reconnections. Thank you. And with her, we have uh, Patrick Mao Power, uh, who's a phenomenal uh, musician as well, uh, and you should check out his YouTube channel, uh, who is a Doeba man from the Guda Maluigal. Am I pronouncing correctly? Uh, Patrick, can you help me? <laughs> yeah, okay. A uh, region no, of. The okay, thank you. He's <laughs> <laughs> a legend in his local remote community of Thursday Island, nestled in the beautiful tropical waters of far north Queensland, Australia. From humble beginnings, his passion for music and his drive to uplift other people has seen him perform live to thousands of people and stream all over the world. Through his company, One Blood Hidden Image, OBHI, Patrick has connections to many community organizations, including My Pathway and Community Owned Enterprises. Patrick's company, OBHI Entertainment Group, brings people together for a music experience to remember through live performance. And as a proud indigenous man who came from Little, He's passionate about creating opportunity and possibility for young people everywhere. By reinvesting a substantial portion of OBHI's profits back into meaningful community programs in music, film, creative arts, and live production, he's creating a groundswell right across Australia's youth scene. Over to you, Patrick and Tiara. Thank you yeah. so much. So I'm gonna start, first of all, um, just checking how much time do I have? 15 minutes. 15 15 to 20. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to, first of all, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I work and the people I'm still collaborating with, mainly in uh, Victoria, Australia, the Rangiri, Bonarung, Jajarung, but also the many other First Nations I've been working with and been inspiring me and teaching uh, so, so much of what I know today. So they've been very kind and generous, allow me to, as an Indigenous person, to enter the families, the homes, and to share the stories with me. And um, so I'll tell a bit more about it also, you know, um, where it come from um, tomorrow. But today I would like to also introduce this work, collaborative work I've been doing with Patrick, as well as other people. And Patrick will get a chance also to introduce himself right now and, and say uh, where he's coming from in terms also of his expectations for the kind of project that we're working on and, uh, you know, future uh, collaborations and, and future projects. Uh, but first, uh, I would like also to um, acknowledge and introduce the other people who've worked with us, namely, you are not seen in a moment one person, but it's myself, Aline Kamara, who is a Sierra Leonean artist, um, storyteller, who's based in London, so I grew up in London as well, it goes back and forth from London, Sierra Leone, Patrick and Despina uh, Zakradu, who is a VR uh, artist. So the project was born out of a, an interest we've got for performance, storytelling, music. We came together, been collaborating with Patrick and Alim for quite a while now. And we decided they wanted to do something around VR, initially around performance in VR, but mainly was around stories. And we thought, you know, the power of stories is really important, uh, not just for, you know, indigenous generations and younger generations in particular. It is a way to reconnect older and younger um, 
generations, but also it's important um, within empire and the kind of work we can do in terms of decolonization can start from stories. So I'll just, um, you know, now pass it on to Patrick to kind of present, um, you know, who he is and what he does and what he's expecting out of this work. And I'll say a bit more about the background um, to this work. Patrick, do you want to say something about how it all came about and your ideas around VR? Thank you very much, um, Kiara. Uh, and I first, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians from where I'm broadcasting from, or uh, this the Zoom meeting um, from the Kaiwalaga region, the Kaiwalaga nations uh, here up in uh, Kero Straits. Uh, and just want to say thank you very much for um, you know, allowing me the opportunity to have a discussion here. Um, and thank you very much for that introduction. That was like a lot. <laughs> so they're like, whoa, that's a great introduction. Uh, but working on this project um, with Kiara, it came around, um, as you said, from the interest uh, about how we can take st um, storytelling using um, different mediums uh, to be able to create an immersive experience. And that was what was interesting to me. Um, during my time, I had uh, the opportunity, uh, you know, as an artist, to be able to work with different organizations uh, to be uh, be able to tell storytellers in um, you know, the medium of virtual reality, augmented reality, and just be able to uh, make it as an educational tool. Uh, and when we started to talk about our project with the team, uh, that was um, the interesting part of how we can take the storytelling that we do with music and be able to put it into this new, uh, well, this, this immersive experience and, uh, and bring culture, the cultural elements into it. Uh, so that's how this came about for me. Thanks, Patrick. And then, you know, after the first conversation, uh, it was quite interesting because both Patrick and Alim started talking about objects and relevance of objects, especially because some of us in the United Kingdom, most of the cultural objects are um, still today in, you know, um, held in institutions such as the British Museum. So we started talking about reconnections and, well, digital repatriation at the start. And I thought this, such, this term is such a loaded term and problematic term. And how can we actually think about repatriation in a different way? So we thought about digital reconnect, reconnections as a way to think about ways in which people from the communities can engage with those objects. So, um, you know, first of all, we started from stories. We thought yes. that digital stories are really important because they weave together past, present and future. And, and thanks to rich relation and connective narratives. And this is something that indigenous uh, peoples, first nations have done for uh, millennia. So it is a long standing practice and still holds great value, not only for first nations, but also for you know, people who don't see themselves as first nations or identify as indigenous. This is why we thought stories can be the starting point for other decolonizing process, even within empire, something that is not too scary because one of the problems that we've seen also talking to Tony Perry earlier and other people is that sometimes non-Indigenous people approach these topics with end up very cautious. Sometimes they push back, sometimes get angry, sometimes they don't accept the historical facts. So we wanted to also use VR as a tool for um, to require <clears throat> empathy. And this started for also my own experiences uh, using VR and getting quite emotional watching and, and being part of stories where the people were telling their own perspectives and engaging audiences in a really interesting way. So um, we know that also First Nations around the world and Patrick is testament to that because he's an entrepreneur, he uses digital platforms and the media uh, to engage uh, not only his own community, but other indigenous communities in Australia, around the world, and also non-indigenous audiences, which is really important. So um, and First Nations around the world have been experimenting with technologies for centuries, uh, even before, you know, uh, what we, we think. And uh, a lot of scholars like Faye Gensborg, as well as um, Hickson and uh, also Brian Carson, uh, Indigenous scholars from Queensland, they've all identified the uses of either media, digital platforms, technologies by Indigenous people. So when we talk about the digital divide, we need to be very careful because yeah, the digital divide can be in some ways um, can can be given and also can be um, a something related to access to technologies and access to resources. But when it comes to actually embracing these technologies, we see that indigenous peoples are very active and they actually use those technologies to reflect their own perspectives, their own views. 
So they've been, you know, uh, doing a lot of great work when it comes to also representation, telling their own stories from their own perspectives and, and also instructing and educating people who come from different backgrounds. So I think it is really important and I've been looking, I'm not going to get into the um, academic part of it because I think it's more important to present and to, to talk about how we can move forward in terms of both collaborations between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples. I, I don't like these terms, these dichotomies, to be honest, but for lack of a better word, we will be using uh, those terms right now. So I think it's also productive to look at, you know, points of connections, um, differences as well, yes, but also those, um, you know, places where we can metaphorically speaking, but also physically where we can actually connect and, and build. So um, we use a methodology uh, which is based on yarning, uh, which is also, uh, I use Besrab and Dandu here, but it's a very well-known methodology within Indigenous communities in Australia. And Patrick can also say something about it. Uh, it's about sharing stories, it's about learning from other people, it's about also building strong relationships. And I'll tell you something more also about yarning um, tomorrow. And you know, I've been part of certain yarning circles, and sometimes we wonder as not indigenous peoples how we can uh, participate, um, being respectful, and how we can also give back. So without you know, um Challenging the, the voices of other people and um, and showing just our perspectives. So also we've looked at how we could do this kind of work in VR through the colonizing methodologies. And again, you know, there, there'll be ways to talk about this um, during this conference. And we looked at community-based participatory research, which we haven't done yet because this is just the first stage of a much bigger project that we want to uh, develop. Um, obviously, we need the funding for it, but we are very much, um, you know, into this process of securing funding. And, and again, you know, story work, there is a lot of literature in particular um, by Indigenous scholars where story work is really relevant. Obviously, Archibald and other scholars are not the only ones who have talked about this, but uh, there are many other scholars who have um, pointed to the importance, the relevance of Archibald. Uh, of um of stories in Star Wars work and not just Archibald. So I think it's really relevant to talk about this. And uh, um also wanted to now pass it on to Patrick and tell how we got into the mask. So we, we said, you know, let's do this project around performances because both Patrick and Alim are performers. But then they all connected around the idea of objects. Yes, we are performance, but we're also using objects in our performances. And we thought objects are great because some of these objects have been in their homes, are quite ubiquitous. And Aline said, I grew up seeing this mask, the Bondo mask from Western Africa. And uh, for Alim, uh, in, you know, this is a, a very important part of his identity. And Patrick the same, you know, we we're talking, he said, I think the Tatusha mask is such an important part of the Torres Strait culture. And also, you know, when he does his performances, he uses um, some, you know, of, his, of these iconic artifacts in his performances as well um, with the dancers. And, and so it was quite interesting to see that both wanted to work with objects and that, you know, the, the idea of a performance turned into let's talk about objects and how objects can speak back, but also reconnect the younger generations to the older and Indigenous and non-Indigenous audiences together. Patrick, do you want to say something about the turtle shell mask and uh, your relationship to it? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, with with the, the mask, turtle shell tradition, uh, and all traditions, the representation of the mask actually carries the story with it. Uh, for us, when we, it was interesting that we had a discussion around this before this project came. Uh, how it came about was for me back in 2015, uh, I had the opportunity as an artist to go over to, um, to London and perform. Uh, at the British Museum as well as um, at Cambridge University. Uh, and then we got to see some of the collections that have been removed from the Torres Straits uh, back in the 1800s uh, with the Haddon collection. And that was something inspiring. And, and that was what triggered our conversation to be able to uh, use um, virtual reality to be able to talk about um, you know, the, the cultural repatriation, which I'll get into a bit later. But the significance of a mask that when you carry it, it's a, a spiritual connection that Every mask that is created, and as you can see, this mask that I'm using the image, the shell crocodile mask, uh, are the Western regions where I come from. Uh, and what happens is when you create this thing, it brings the spirit to life that it connects um, 
the being to the spiritual world. And that's why when we perform, we're able to carry the essence of the story. And that's how it's lived. Uh, and that's how it's been. And that, that's, this is why um, we use the traditional mask still today in our performances, both cultural and uh, within my performances. So I fuse the cultural uh, performances with the contemporary art form of, of, of hip hop. Uh, and we're able to tell the story. And that was quite interesting when we had the conversation that Alim also came up with that. And we thought that it would be the best way to tell the representation of how culture is connected, not only in, um, you know, the, the, the current in the natural world we're human, but also the metaphysical and how the spiritual alignment is the essence of where culture is born from. Yes. Hello? Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry? Yeah, I can hear you. I thought I, I thought I cut off because I didn't hear. Okay. Yes, yes, but a couple right. of things I wanted to say that a couple of things I wanted to mention that um, you, you touched on was the, the fact of the um, oral tradition uh, where you say Yanni. Uh, culture is a person already. Uh, it's not, it's, we have written text and we have um, art forms and objects, but the oral form is also a very big part of the element. So as you can see with the cultural mass, we don't only um, uh, do the chants and do, uh, speak to the song, we actually talk to the object as a living being. Uh, if you ever see one of the, the Torres Strait traditional masks that's in museum, it's a living entity that we see that once it's once it's um once it's born or connected to the person, it actually connects them to that that alignment where you can be connected to your ancestors. Yeah, great, and that, that's a great point actually because uh, what we wanted to achieve with this is when people are are in the experience and they they need to sense and need to see the objects as being alive. So we also adopted a something called adding phenomenology where objects and agentive are alive. They're not just inanimate objects, but so we wanted to um, shift those perspectives and allow people to kind of um, move from one paradigm to the other. Um, so trying to embody and, and understand that in the first person. Um, and sometimes they're not, it's not easy. So we thought that VR uh, allows for that to, to happen um, more than any other um, kind of immersive experience. So we are hoping to achieve this. And uh, these are some of the, um, fortunately you can't see them all, but some of the, uh, the initial ideas. The idea was for users to wear the mask. So as they get into the VR experience, they see the world through the mask. So they are the mask. So they become the, the animate that object, they become agentive. And um, so we had two different uh, areas. First of all, we start from Sierra Leone and we see in particular in Sierra Leone, the Bondo mask is associated to um, female genital mutilation uh, and um, also feminine rituals um, of coming of age. And this was quite problematic because it raised a lot of questions around in particular you know, for, uh, for women around, uh, you know, respect for, for the body and especially in the Western world, how to engage with that. And a lot of women within the uh, Alim's community and Alim was very aware, he said, I don't want to talk, um, you know, for women, I don't want to embrace that kind of view because I'm aware that some of the business is sacred and it's really important to respect that. On the other hand, we had a conversation where uh, Despina uh, was very uncomfortable about talking, um, you know, or incorporating and using the Bondo mask because the Bondo mask is also part of this process and uh, of this practice. And so we thought, let's let's not get into the politics of it. Let's talk about the Bondo mask from a cultural perspective about what it is, what it represents, and uh, let allow also people and participants to kind of understand uh, where you know where we're coming from and also to draw those conclusions in some ways. So here we see the uh, young girls um, appearing behind the trees and then the trees, uh, well, the girls turn into trees and as you see the world through the mask. And then obviously this is open to discussion. So we also want the experience to kind of, you know, open, um, open up discussions, uh, allow people to Think deeply about um, you know all sorts of questions, um, ethical questions, but at the same time about how indigenous voices can be represented, how stories and cultural practices can be represented and discussed um, in complex ways. And at the same time, uh, we then moved on to the notorious phrase with the element of water. 
So then we see the world again through the mask and we see um, the turtles and uh, Torres Strait boys um, just, you know, um, you know, riding the turtles and eventually everything, all of these images turn into London. Eventually we come back to London, the heart of empire, and we see blood uh, on the buildings that signifies um, the violence of colonialism that is still present today. It's still a, a working process, but I think it's quite interesting to see some of the images. Um, it's still quite rough, uh, but you see, you know, where we are coming from in the ideas. And I've got to say, there were a lot of discussions on how to do this in, in ethical ways, how to incorporate those policies and allow non-Indigenous, in particular, uh, audiences to engage with uh, with this. So um, some of the objectives when it comes to um, what we're trying to do is to obviously uh, use this kind of experience uh, within the communities, both in Sierra Leone and in uh, the Torres Strait, to allow younger generations to engage with those objects in new ways, because in some communities, and, and Patrick again expand on this, uh, you know, some of those uh, traditions are uh, disappear in some ways, or the, the you know the younger generations feel a bit disengaged at times. So this could be a, a way for them to embrace um, those ideals and in, in, in those values again. But also, uh, we we would like to bring this to those cultural institutions where those objects are um, kept, held hostage in some ways, or um, you know in, in ways to kind of study discussion also with you know those institutions and also with audiences who might not know the history of, of those objects. But also we like to, you know, we talked about decolonization, how it can be done here, if it can, you know, if we could actually start this discussion from Empire, it's a question obviously uh, that we need to investigate. But um Patrick, do you want to add anything in relation to some of the objectives and what we are, are trying to do? Uh, no, no, just I think you covered everything. Um, it, it really is a, it is a work in progress, but I guess the, with the objective of what, because uh, from a cultural perspective and uh, from the cultural element of you know, the mass, and that's why we chose it, is very, uh, very sacred. So giving the opportunity to actually see from the perspective of a, uh, a cultural or traditional uh, custodian to see the views of how we see um, our, our culture and our um, experiences through this, um, you know, through, through, through a lens, if you want to say. But our objective is simply that, to be able to be um, create the conversation, uh, be able to share the culture, and um, be able to uh, you know, engage and start the dialogue to be able to talk about um, uh, everything that you discovered. Thank you so much. I guess, you know, we've done, obviously there's way more that we, we should cover and we can cover, but, uh, you know, we're running out of time, obviously, and we want also the other speakers to, um, yeah, talk about their presentation. So thank you so much, Patrick. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Obviously, if you have questions, we're more than happy yeah. to answer all your questions. And thanks again for joining us from your boat. So Patrick is in the <laughs> boat right now. So yeah. As you see, another crew is just working at that He's got to go check on the papers. So, <laughs> but thank you very much. And we are still alive and happy to answer any questions that are later and look forward to all the other presentations that came here. So uh, thank you everybody. Um, yeah. Look forward to the next sessions. Um, Luca Amber Lelena uh, Anupagunin is a Samoan indigenous Pacific poet and deeper candidate at the University of Oxford in social anthropology, researching the relationships between Pacific indigenous diasporic epistemologies, intersectionalities, and climate injustice. Prior to this, they studied ethnomusicology, Pacific studies, and cultural anthropology in Etoria, New Zealand, where they were involved in several Pacifica grassroots organizations. They published poetry in Stasis and Out Here, an anthology of Taka Takui and LGBTQIA plus writers from Aotearoa, and articles in WSANZ and Perfect B. Over to you, Nika. Your presentation is here. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to the speakers that have gone before and also the ones after. Thank you also to the people and the places that have informed this paper. As um, previously mentioned, my name is Luka Ambalilinga Nakabunin and I will be covering Pacific Studies and Cultural and um, Colonial Epistemic Injustice in, uh, in Academia. So to give you, let's see, there we go. 
to give you a brief outline of the presentation, we'll be beginning with a few differentiations of disciplines in positioning, uh, a brief overview of what epistemic injustice is in its various forms, and some more kind of concrete examples through the two contexts on the screen, um, and which will be followed by probably a non-conclusion. So in order to explain the context, there are Pacific studies, Maori studies, critical indigenous studies, and indigenous studies. I primarily come through the vein of Pacific studies as established in Aotearoa New Zealand, which necessarily means being influenced by Maori studies. Although both of these and critical indigenous studies can be conceptualized as forms of indigenous studies, um, it could also be argued that there are significant enough divergences between them to constitute distinct yet linked disciplines in their own rights. Aside from the divisions indicated by name, there are crucial differences in terms of um, the philosophies of the disciplines that draw from regional, political, and historical formations. As is common in Indigenous contexts, there are multiple narratives about the origins of Pacific studies in Aotearoa New Zealand. However, I will be relaying the one with which I am most familiar in terms of presences in academia anyway. Uh, Teresia Tewa was born in Hawaii and grew up in Fiji. Her mother is Black, more specifically African American, and her father is Ikaribus Barnaban. Um, in 2000, she began the first undergraduate major in Pacific Studies, where she continued as director for the next 17 years, fusing Pacific intellectual, artistic, and activist forms in particularly generative ways, in my opinion. Uh, to explain where I fit into all of this, I am Samoan and affiliate to the villages of Nganga Suffolk and Sanapu. I was born in the UK, where I spent the first, most of the first um, 13 years of my life and then was in New Zealand for the next 11. Now being positioned back in the UK where Pacific Studies is not a discipline that most people are likely to hear much about, unless perhaps studying at St. Andrews, I have been using critical indigenous studies to frame my methodological and intellectual designs. Uh, to my mind, what distinguishes critical indigenous studies from indigenous studies is that it tends to engage with the profundity of coloniality in ways that indigenous studies largely does not. To give you a brief idea of what I mean by the profundity of coloniality, one can have an understanding of the violence and oppressions embedded in coloniality without necessarily understanding how it plays out in people's daily lives, and more particularly for this presentation, how this plays out in academia and how to respond to it. Also, when I use the term indigenous, I am using it in the wider sense that also refers to displaced indigenous people. The definition of epistemic injustice I use as inspired by Dotson, Fricker and Sozi is injustice that is inflicted to and through knowledge systems, which necessarily means that it's to do with people, culture, ecologies, language, politics, history, and further areas given the interconnections between all of these. Injustice, of course, in this context has distinctly cultural overtones and is thus often deeply intertwined with coloniality. Uh, there are various forms, such as epistemic oppression, which is, as defined by Christy Dotson, persistent epistemic exclusion that hinders one's contribution to knowledge production. She differentiates between this and epistemic exclusion, which is unwarranted infringement on the epistemic agency of knowledge. Epistemic exploitation is defined by Berenstain as what happens when people from oppressed communities are pressured by people in oppressing communities or perhaps more euphemistically privileged communities to educate them about the oppression that the latter perpetuates. Silencing in this context can be understood as the stoppage of an epistemic transfer at some point, be it before, during, or after it's articulated. Medina and Dotson have different ways of carving this up, and I do find both useful, but for the moment, I'll be focusing on the way Dotson does this. So she identifies two forms, a testimonial quieting, which is when listeners do not recognize a speaker as knowing or knowledgeable, and testimonial smothering, which is when speakers limit their own testimonies only to areas with which listeners have been judged to be competent. Moving on to the first context, there are a number of areas that have be, that can be pointed out that my friends and I have found being Pacific Indigenous students in the UK. The first is a brief story that comes from one of the research training sessions held for incoming doctoral students pre-transfer. One of the things told to students is that communities can be wary of Oxford researchers and um, no explanation of what, why this might be was provided. Um, and the proposed solution to this was to get a letter from a local university stating that one is a researcher and why one is there. Now, there are many things that could be unpicked here, but focusing on indigenous perspectives, there are multiple well-evidenced reasons why one should be wary of academic research in all areas. The local university solution proposed 
is one that can only be constructed whilst disengaged from Indigenous research concerning histories of academic exploitation, which are ongoing. Secondly, there is the idea that one does not have any ethical obligations to the Indigenous communities with which one works. At least in the Indigenous context with which I am familiar, it is not possible to do research with Indigenous communities without accepting and acting within a reciprocal relationship of trust. And the idea that one can do research without this relationship is one that has distinctly colonial origins, overtones and outcomes. Thus, there are questions to ask about why, in an ostensibly Indigenous context, one would opt to use a colonial cultural implement and the consequences of this. There are various guidelines that social anthropologists, I'm currently based in social anthropology, are required to follow in order to ensure that people involved with research are able to give or withhold informed consent so as to not, and also so as to not economically exploit the communities with which one works. However, a significant element that is often missing from these guidelines is who has the power to determine what constitutes informed consent, what constitutes economic exploitation, what constitutes accountability, and so forth. As um, and often in the experiences of Indigenous people, this skews in favour of white and some further groups of non-Indigenous researchers. I will mostly be staying out of data sovereignty because it's a massive area in and of itself, but suffice to say that similar issues are also present here. Indigenous knowledge is often not present in non-Indigenous studies disciplines, as it is not often perceived as being important or relevant. Uh, Mikhaide, whose book I'm currently reading, perhaps put it best. In making this point, I refer to Mary Ellen Turple's discussion of the propensity of non-Indigenous people to assume that any ignorance on their part about Indigenous people is simply a gap in their knowledge which may be filled, rather than an imperative which may shift the paradigm of knowledge. This perception arguably influences the ways in which Indigenous knowledge is engaged with or is attempted to be engaged with in Indigenous focused research in various disciplines. A common occurrence is for Indigenous knowledge to be misrepresented and or incorrectly represented by non-Indigenous academics. However, because of testimonial quieting and episodic trespassing, these incorrect presentations are widely perceived as correct and the presentations of Indigenous knowledge by Indigenous academics widely perceived as incorrect, occurring in such instances as environmental practices, cultural protocol, educational methods, and further. A further issue is when decisions are made to include Indigenous knowledge in academic contexts um, and only perceiving it to exist outside of the university, and in doing so are raising the crucial work done by Indigenous academics within the university. While I have noticed in much Indigenous focused scholarship, it is recognized that knowledge can be transmitted by carving, dance, music, poetry, voyaging, images, and further forms, the curricular formats have been slow to change. One of the innovations made by Tetsuya Tewa starting in the Pacific Studies undergraduate program was to allow students to use artistic forms to convey knowledge and evidence of learning, a format in which Indigenous students tend to perform better. Further non-Indigenous academics noticed this and began adopting similar practices within their own courses, but of course the method in which this was done is also important. A critique of this implementation that was made in anthropology by Indigenous undergraduates at the time was the justification of why one was using a non-essay format was required, whereas no justification for using an essay format was needed. And it is important to note that this is a format in terms of the essay format that has largely excluded and continues to exclude Indigenous people from engaging in knowledge exchange. After these critiques were voiced, changes were made. Additionally, and this could have taken up the time of the entire presentation, there are significant pedagogical obligations, sometimes pedagogical burdens, placed on Indigenous, indigenous academics, and I quote directly from Ubress's 2016 article. Some colleagues are unencumbered by ex expectations for care work, community work, and service work, was a part of the reality of racialized minority and indigenous scholars. In addition to this care and service work, the legitimacy of minority and indigenous scholars research is often questioned because it does not fit neatly within canonized frameworks or is suspect because it does not contain, sustain the fiction of objectivity. All of these are serious structural problems in academia. It is not to say that we should be unencumbered, but rather all researchers in our community should feel encumbered and act accordingly. So for the closing remarks, I chose not to title this as a conclusion because I am wary of the ways in which the term has been positioned as the decisive last word on something, and this is not the decisive last word at all. 
a question that has been posed about focuses on epistemic injustice as opposed to carceral injustice, biomedical injustice, climate injustice, and so forth, is why, foc why not focus on these issues which are more pertinent and knowledge is too abstracted. And my response to this is that although a lot of further injustice is that a lot of further injustices take place because of epistemic injustice and that all of these are interconnected and interlinked. Another counter to trying to prevent epistemic injustice is that it's too difficult to learn about and implement indigenous epistemic protocols. And my response to this is that it's far more difficult for indigenous people to participate in processes that require the devaluing of indigenous knowledge and people and far more dangerous to perpetuate structures that do active harm to communities and environments. The reason why I use the phrase methodically designed in the abstract is because preventing epistemic injustice um, and in doing so, assisting in preventing further forms of injustice is not something that's accidental. It requires a sustained commitment on multiple fronts, partnership as opposed to consulting with indigenous communities and knowledge holders is necessary, including those in academia. Speaking more from the climate space, there has been a growing hegemonic recognition that indigenous knowledge is in fact important, um, who knew? And to this, I would add that whilst it is deeply important to engage with indigenous knowledge, it is not possible to properly engage with this whilst looking down on it as an inferior form of expertise, nor without having sufficient cap cap capability to understand and respond responsibly to the paradigms in which it is situated. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Luca. I think you've raised some very important uh, questions around authority, erasure, invisibility, things that I think we can discuss further. Finally, uh, the last speaker of this session is Professor Sunita Sarkar, uh, who teaches in women's gender and sexuality studies in English at McAllister College, which is in the lands of the Sisseton and uh, Wapitan peoples. Her monograph, Women Writing Race, Nation and History Native, was published in August this year. And her essay on Zitkalasa and uh, Grazia Deleda in a collection on indigenous modernisms is forthcoming this year as well. Her monograph in progress uh, is on whiteness in postmodernist English literature, and she's published essays on Foucault, Benjamin, Gramsci, Wolf, and a host of other writers. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Um, Buju is the greetings in Ojibwe language, and I believe in the call and response. So I invite you to just say Buju back to me. It's B O O Z or Z H O O. Buju. Can I can I hear you? Buju. Buju. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for including me in this uh, conference, and congratulations to the group and and the conference itself. It's a lot of hard work. And I want to recognize that. I also thank the speakers before me. Their words are so meaningful and resonant. So please consider my words as a modest footnote. If I may be so bold as to represent the point of view of indigenous identity in the United States and some tribal or native peoples in other parts of the world, we are living in a post-apocalyptic present. What is Indigenous studies in such a present and what can its future be? I've started with the issue of time indicated in the title of the conference, Pasts, Presents and Futures. I'm, I'm very pleased that the plural is used. And in a moment, I'll get to the issue of spatiality or territoriality implied in the phrase Indigenous studies. However, a close scrutiny of time will shed light on Indigenous studies as a field, as a space, as a demarcated territory of inquiry. My focus for a bit is on the, on the linear narrative of global colonial modernity implied in the serial arrangement of past, present, and future on what Mark Rifkin has termed settler colonial time. While the plural might indicate that there are many pasts, presents, and futures, I want to bring our attention to the fact that various narrative, if existent, are either erased or subsumed into a singular view of time. I also want to draw attention to the work of Jody Bird, uh, their book, The Transit of Empire, in this context. 
The German Polish anthropologist Johannes Fabian in his book, Time and the Other, outlines how colonial powers designate the native, the indigenous, the tribal as being suspended in an inactive continuum of time and other who is deemed to be outside modernity, colonial modernity, I might add, are not unable or made unable to participate in dominant present and future. To this in my recent book titled Native, I bring the distinction of time from history. Time is the static continuum or the cyclical rhythms of nature and history with a capital H being the past, present and future of progress and production, both of which are determined primarily by capitalist machineries. I began by depicting the present as post-apocalyptic for the native an experience in which colonizing and genocidal powers attempt to destroy and even annihilate indigenous past or preserve it in suspension in glass cabinets in the museum as indicative of the non-modern, as indicative irrelevant to the narrative of progress. The intention is also to erase it from national memory and consider the native as no longer present as implied in the use of the term, the vanishing Indian in the United States. Extinct, absent from the present and therefore the future. I want to point out here the very naming of tribal, indigenous, aboriginal, native, derived from the lexicon of white, capital W, white, colonial modernity in the United States, the UK and Europe, to name only three instances. <clears throat> Space and time are co-constituted and both carry the unwanted and impos imposed burden of colonial modernity. Indigenous studies as a field of inquiry named as such exists in the present as an archeology span of the apocalypse, doing the work of digging, retrieving, brushing off the mud and mire of burial and re-narrativizing the artifacts or arguing against dom dominant modernity while within it. Either way, indigenous studies has adopted the terms of the hegemonic powers that seek to erase it in, in identifying and describing its heritages and what it generates. I am not dismissing the work. Indeed, I believe it is necessary. Thus the first word in the title of my paper, necessary. But to the second word in the title of my paper, it is not sufficient, not sufficient if indigenous studies is to avoid being co-opted and consumed into a dominant nationalist capitalist production factory. I consider academia largely to seek to conform to as well as produce nationalist narratives. If academia carries the burden and legacy of colonial modernity, then it is likely to continue to segregate and absorb indigenous studies. Spatially speaking, how indigenous studies exist currently, at least in the United States, ironically mimics the reservation into which First Nations peoples have been corralled. Sovereign as those territories are, I mean the reservation may be, the tension within the dominant nation state remains both juridically and culturally. Take the goals of Zitkala Shah, on whom I've written in the book Native, an early 20th century activist, cultural creator and founder of the National Council of American Indians, as well as secretary of the Society of American Indians. She was instrumental in the implementation of the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act, and also in advocating for tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Her work analyzed in my book has inspired me to return to the field of indigenous studies and pose the same question. Are we asking for anything? And if yes, what is it that we're asking for? I mean, the history of ethnic studies, feminist studies, queer studies have asked themselves the same question. I began with temporality. I want to turn to spatiality or politically inflected territoriality. Once it is named indigenous studies, it both highlights the focus, but also re-territorializes and segregates, absolving the hegemonic mainstream dominant field of any responsibility for it. I think of the word minor, which indigenous studies as a field is at the moment, as conveying permanent disturbance or ongoing questioning of borders and boundaries. The field indigenous studies ha as, has the opportunity to name itself as contingent and contextual and allow for the possibility of renaming while doing the work of representation that alters the view of what constitutes a field. If we think of Deleuze and Guattari's term rhizomatic, indigenous studies may create the propulsion to disturb, to create the constant clamor 
as I've called it in the introduction to my book, the clamor to claim visibility within and thus redefine the dominant. What is considered British or Italian or Australian may be redefined through indigenous studies. Speaking here in this present moment in an academic institution, let me speak of education or what I call maleducation from the native perspective. I'll take the two figures I've written about, Deleta of Sardinia. After some initial tutelage, she learned standard Italian on her own and wrote in it, though never abandoning her native language, Logudorese, in spirit and rhythm. At the same time, the island of Sardinia was read by literatures, positivists, sociologists, and philosophers as a space suspended in time, innately backward, even criminal. The Leda went on to win the Nobel Prize in Literature for Italy in 1926. 1926 was also the year that Mussolini celebrated the Leda's recognition for Italy, and also the year that he incarcerated Antonio Gramsci, a Sardinian anti-fascist dissident. To turn to another example, boarding schools may have a different resonance among some of the audience here, but they were a tool of North American modernity that wrenched, mutilated, tortured, and reshaped native people on the continent. Hair, language, dress, comportment, diet. Zid Kalasha writes about the agony of this intended transformation. She was the first at White's Manual Labor Institute. The name itself encapsulates what boarding schools did at that time. That is, strip all signs of indigenous culture, the past of the title of this conference, and churn out manual laborers for the nation's, uh, the United States arrival into modernity. Zid Kalasha then went on, by the way, to study at a liberal arts institution, Earlham College in Indiana. I am situated on the lands of the Sistan and Wapatans peoples of the Dakotas. I speak from an institution that is based on lands of which the Sistan and Wapatan peoples were dispossessed and from which they were driven out. The land grant to white colonizing settlers is the basis on which Macalester College came to be established in 1874 as a Scottish Presbyterian seminary. So my words today are hosted in the presence of and by the grace of Wapitan and Sisseton peoples, and my work moves in the direction of decolonial equity and justice. In order to move towards a decolonial frame, I submit three things. First, that we would need to establish our positionality so that we do not take the stance of the supposedly objective analyst who reproduces colonial anthropology. For instance, I am neither native to Minnesota nor native with a capital N in Minnesota. It's about identity and about labor. Dalit feminism in Nepal, the Toda in the Nilgiri Hills, the tribal ancestry of the cosmopolitan Cornelia Sarabji from an India that was not yet independent from the British Empire, and the Guarani ancestry of the Argentinian publisher Victoria Acampo are just some examples of how one establishes one's positionality. So similarly, we would have to identify ourselves, at least modestly, I'll say I would have to identify myself as middle class or from impoverished backgrounds, an academic, a settler, an immigrant, a diasporic or native, depending on um, representations within certain contexts. Secondly, we will have to deal with issues of gender, sexuality and nationality, of course, but also with matters of race and ethnicity. Representation on the website of the Anarchist Library, the World Directory of Minorities and Indigenous Peoples, and MinorityRights.org are very revealing in this regard. I also refer to Shannon Speed's work on white supremacy and Indigenous women migrants in this context. I noticed that native in North America lies both within and outside the dominant vocabularies of race, red having been abandoned as a slur only recently. We will have to contend with white, capital W white, but also with brown or black nationalist agendas. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm starting another monograph on whiteness, and I don't think I could have started that without addressing nativeness first. And thirdly, work has to be done at more than one level simult simultaneously, both individually and comparatively. Individual biographies and analyses of individual works is necessary for the knowledge to emerge into our collective consciousness. However, having juxtaposed Zit Kalasha and the Sardinian Nobel Prize winner Grazia Deledda 
I can say that it has allowed me to demonstrate the uniqueness of each of them in a much more nuanced way than if I had approached them individually. So I advocate for comparative indigeneity and also for juxtaposition of indigenous with so-called mainstream contemporaries. Why? Remember that I had raised the issue of the conundrum of indigenous studies as a field. At the same time that it demarcates a territory, it makes itself vulnerable to the paradox of segregation as well as absorption, an always minor and separate, separated area that bears not at all upon the dominant. Even if we are to adopt consciously the narrative of linear time, what kind of future lies ahead? I say that the future of that field to disturb, to redefine dominant categories can only be repar reparative justice. That is to bring just recognition to the particularity of indigenous life and contribution and also redefine the dominant rather than perpetuate the status quo. Thank you.